So, uh, let me briefly introduce CEEW to you. So, Council on Energy, Environment and Water is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, the way it has been uh, made, it is not allowed to do any pers personal consultancy, any private consultancy for any industry. It is independent. By independent, what we mean is we the research we undertake is not influenced by the funders. So, methodology is ours. There is no influence from funders on the methodology. And definitely, it is a policy research institute. So, we work with government at different levels and we undertake both primary and secondary research to influence policy at a national level. Now, as the name suggests, it is Council on Energy, Environment and Water. So, in energy, we are working mostly on renewables. We are also looking at access issues related to energy. We just finished a, a year long project on energy access where we try to gauge the choice of energy that people use in different rural areas, why they are using wood, why they are using charcoal, is there access to LPG, if not then is it uh, obligatory or they are making a choice themselves. So, these are some of the issues we addressed in these issues again uh, in this project then we are working on subsidies we are developing a road map for renewable in if in case we want to achieve the target the government has said similarly on environment front we are looking at hfcs how our current growth scenario will impact hfc in future then uh, how can we bring rural development but uh, on the other hand, we will have to ensure it is low carbon. So, we are working in different states looking at the options, feasible option based on resources available to bring in low carbon rural development. And water, which ma'am already said is very close to my heart. And uh, most of the project uh, that are mentioned here, I have been the lead in these projects. So, I will, uh, while I am discussing about water issues in India, I will, I will try and relate these projects whenever it makes sense. And if you want to see what we do in detail, you can visit our website. So, uh, since all of you are known to this sector, you have done two semesters, uh, you must be knowing few, few of the figures that I am going to show, but it's still it is good to revise them. So, uh, the first slide and uh, you would see this slide again and again since you are working in this sector. Uh, the annual precipitation that India receives is around 4000 cube uh, kilometer cube that is BCM. So, 4000 BCM out of which only 1123 BCM is utilizable. Now, uh, the thing is this utili utilizable volume changes and it changes along with change in climate. So, if Suppose the monsoon period generally is of two months, two and a half months and in few places it is getting reduced to say one month. So, you will have same amount of rainfall in some cases, but with a very within a very short duration. Now, you do not have enough storage capacity. If you see the per capita storage capacity in India is only 219 in meter cube. So, the problem is sometimes it is the shortage issue is because of, because of two problems. One is quantity, one is security. So, even if you have you receive water in sufficient quantity, the problem is you do not have the structures to store it. Now, whether or not storing is a viable option is uh, another matter of discussion, but nowadays storing water in soil is is being promoted as one of the most feasible options, especially friendly to farmers in different areas and which does not require too much of construction. If we see the sector wise use of water, we can clearly see, see this data you are seeing right now, it says irrigation consumes 85 percent. We do not have much clue, we, we cannot say concretely that it is 85 percent, but we can definitely say that it consumes the highest and it consumes above 75 percent. The problem is this 75 or 85 percent is consumed at a very low efficiency and ground water which is said to be the last resort in case of variation in climate when you have 
extreme variances, ground water is the one which supports. Now the irrigation is supported a lot by ground water and the efficiency of system is not that good. So that is a problem of concern that we will have to see. Again per capita water availability is decreasing. Again this figure denotes that it, it is just reflectance of how our population has grown. So more than anything else it is more about how the population has grown. But in addition to that you should also look at this water availability is the amount of water available. But how much of this is usable is another matter of discussion. These things you, you will have to question regularly while you are studying, while you are doing projects because the concept of usable water is very important. You cannot just say available water. Can you use Yamuna water you have available? No. You have to treat it to a certain standard and then only you can use it. So it is very important to understand quality issues when you are talking about quantity issues. As I clearly said that groundwater, the challenges are huge. And this is one of the sectors which are least regulated. So the problem is who is going to regulate it? Is it going to be the government? Is it going to be the NGO? Is it going to be us? And this is a big challenge that you will have to address in future while you are working. You will have to look at groundwater and you will have to do a better research on how to control groundwater uses. You can come up with innovative solutions. Look into how other countries have done this. This is, this is a major sector where much of the work is required. When I talk about non-revenue water, you see all these problems. You see we do not have enough utilizable water, water quality issues are huge, the groundwater is being depleted and still the non-revenue water that is also called unaccounted for water flow, it reaches around 90 percent in some of the cities. So you do not know where 19 percent of the treated water is going you have no accounting for those uh, that volume of water which is huge. When a study was done across 28 cities it was found that on an average it is 39 percent and I am saying you this 39 percent is an understatement of the actual water loss that these cities are suffering from. Now let us see what is the share of major river basins. Definitely, uh, definitely Ganga stands out. It, it has almost 36 percent of the total share and since it is the major river basin let me take you through the status of the Ganga basin right now. Uh, you can read the figures it covers more than a quarter of India's geographical area. It supports about, about 40 percent of the country's population but the problem begins here. Although it is very rich it has alluvial soil but it is amongst the poorest regions in the world which is really sad. And the pollution in Ganga is day by day increasing, especially by the tributaries that are flowing into Ganga, especially rivers such as Yamuna. They bring a lot of pollution and you can clearly see that the burden of disease due to this pollution is huge in different states. Also in some regions it has been found that the due to degradation, even the productivity, the fertility of the soil is decreasing in some of the areas. And all these impact your agriculture on which India is standing right now. It's, it's, it's the basic framework on which India is standing. And the, so we will have to address agriculture as well when we talk about water. There are many problems, numerous problems. You must have read some of these. But I, I will highlight only few of these uh, which I feel has to be addressed in more depth. You will have to, when you are working, you will have to identify few of these challenges and what could be the possible solutions. And the first one that I will, I will suggest you to work on is weak linkage to market. We will have to see how to develop a better linkage to market. In, in market when we go, when we are going to buy pulses, you can clearly see in news it is making headlines. The pulses are reaching a rate of rupees 200 per kg. But are the farmers getting it? No. Then who is getting it? A more in-depth research is required in these fields. How to make innovative markets for these farmers to sell their products? Again, we are very vulnerable. We have a huge share of small and marginal farmers having area less than 2 hectares of land, which is very, very small. If you see other countries, they have huge land area. And when you have a small land area, your input cost increases. 
and even implementing certain intervention becomes more and more difficult. Again and the last is also very important, soil data is really poor. Now, when when we discuss soil data, the problem is uh, what we will say is we do not have sufficient labs for testing soil, but is that the fact? No. When you, when you go on ground, you will see uh, now also you must have heard about the new uh, program that uh, Modi's government has introduced is about uh, developing soil, soil health card for each of the farmers. And uh, you would be surprised to know that each district has a soil lab, soil testing lab. When I was uh, doing a project in uh, Paschim Champaran in Bihar, it was about low carbon rural development. And I, I, I was fortunate to meet the guy who heads the lab. He said that from last one year, not a single farmer has turned with the soil sample. Now, the problem is not technology, the problem is not infrastructure, the problem is in willingness. The farmers do not trust these soil technicians. They, and the first thing is, why should I test my soil? What would it do to me? I have been doing agriculture for a long time. How would it change anything? And you will have to bring these, uh, break these uh, uh, notions, year long notions that, that are there. And I'm, I must tell you here that when you are into fields, when you are interacting with farmers, first hear to them. You should not be recommending them what to do, because they are masters of what they are doing. As we study different subjects, they are also doing the same thing on field. Our teachers, professors encourage us to do a lot of field visits, field surveys. They are doing the same thing on field only. So, they are masters of their knowledge. If, when you are suggesting something, uh, I would first suggest to listen to them and find out a midway, how to make innovation in what they are doing. Now, if, if you see a typical rural setup, what is happening? And I am, I am looking uh, at a rural setup from the lens of a water specialist. When you see, you see that there are common water sources in a rural area, you generally do not have treatment facilities. And your sources are being used by agriculture as well as domestic sector. But Nobody is looking at the runoff where it is going, nobody is looking at the waste where it is going. And this chain is going on and on and on. And I am not included peri-urban agriculture here, which will make the problem even worse. So, if you are going and talking about agriculture, you will have to have you will have to address water, you will have to address soil, you will have to address the agriculture practices. You cannot just try, uh, talk about any one of the sector in silo. Now, let us look at urban water services. We, we, we can see clearly that the access to water within premises has increased uh, in the last decade, but still we have 30 more percent to cover. And I, I would like to ask a question, how many of you are drinking water directly from tap? I do not think any one of you. Either you use RO or you buy bottled water, that is what you do. So, even this within premises access is not for drinking water. Now, let us look at sources of drinking water. Half of us do not know where, where the water is coming from. We are not bothered, which is wrong. Being uh, working in the water sector, you should know these things. You should test your water regularly, what is coming to your house. Similarly, in sanitation, you can clearly see that we are still dependent on septic tanks and one of the one of the studies done by CSE clearly states that 90 percent of the aquifer pollution in urban areas is due to septic tanks because they are not built in a proper way. Similarly, the outlets to the drainage system we have only 45 percent are closed drainage system except that everyone is everything is flowing out without any accountability. It is directly flowing into the rivers, into the storm water drain. We do not have storm water drains. Where do you see storm water drains? These are all waste water flowing. And again, when we talk about this 71 percent, they are also receiving water only for 4 hours <coughs> at max. At few of the places, it is 2 hours. So, this, this whole thing brings again a practice of storing too much of water, then throwing the water when fresh water comes and a lot of problem. I am not going into details of these because that would take another lecture. But let us also look at the wastewater sector. 
now out of the out of the total 57000 uh, million liters per day that is generated the treatment capacity is only of 20000 and that is the maximum capacity th that we have when you see at the capacity that is currently they are working on it is hardly 60 70 percent of the total capacity so the problem is even worse now out of the 302 river stretches that you can see 275 rivers across the country have got polluted and all of us know that this is just data highlighting the severity of the problem but you all know you really live here you know it and this treatment capacity that you see is mostly relying with the metro cities these capacities are only with delhi mumbai kolkata bangalore what about the tier 2 cities we don't have any treatment facilities just going into the rivers uh, let me not go into the cpcb and industrial discharge that's again a different debate altogether now when we analyze the uh, polluted areas and these polluted areas are comprehensive environmental pollution index that CPCB prepared and we map the industrial clusters. We saw that there is a overlapping of industrial clusters across India where there is also pollution of water. So definitely industrials, industrial areas are culprits, we cannot ignore that fact both in terms of quality and quantity. And this is the problem, whose water is it? Industry would say, give it to me, I will bring you development, I will increase the GDP, how can you deny water to me? At the same time, agriculture will say, I have been using it historically, how can you snatch water from me? We are the poors. You cannot talk about snatching water from agriculture, forget about pricing it. And it is a huge political issue. And of course, we are the residents, it's right to life. How can you deny that? How can you price it? All of us use water, but once it becomes wastewater or effluent that is coming, of, coming from industries, all of us deny, I don't know from where it is coming. There is no accountability. Once it comes out of your house, uh, you will not relate it to yourself. Who is going to pay for treatment of this? So that's the problem. That's the problem of common resources. You are not pricing it. First of all, second, you are not having any data on who is using how much and thirdly, no one is accountable. And as I said, uh, as I discussed in the last slide, this is the problem. Everyone, when you talk about pricing water, everyone will say it's right to water, how can you price it? But gladly Dublin, Dublin principles that are widely followed across globe almost every country is following it, has brought out some issues that are very important to address. And first thing is fresh water is a finite and vulnerable resource. I am glad that that point has come up. Because in most of the areas, look at Punjab, look at Haryana, the way they have exploited groundwater, they thought that it is no, never going to end. Nothing is going to happen to the water sector. Someone has said that it is finite and it is vulnerable as well. You will have to use it in a way that it's sustainable. Then the last point is very important. Water has an economic value and it should be recognized as an economic good. Now when I am saying it is an economic good, I am not denying the right to water. I am not denying the right to life. Provide minimum quantity of water required for drinking. If you see the uh, breakup of 135 LPCD that government recommends or 150 LPCD in metro cities, you will see the drinking water is how much? 5 liters, maximum 7-8 liters per capita per day. We are not denying that. But what above it? What above 100 LPCD? Let's give 100 LPCD. So we'll have to evaluate the true cost of water. And again, that is an exercise that you might have to take in future. That is a very important exercise to analyzing the cost of water. Because most of the politicians, most of the bureaucrats, start hearing to you, they get interested when you put a price on something. Other than that, MLD hardly makes any difference to them. It's nothing for them. And above all, even in the condition we see right now, we are, we are in right now, who is paying the price? It's the poor. If you read research articles, you see papers by Terry, by CSC, you will clearly see that we are not the one paying the price. We are getting fairly good quality of water at home. But you go to slums and see 
how much they are paying, how they are fighting for water each day. They, they have tankers coming in and there is a daily a fight between the members for getting water. So, even subsidies are not serving the purpose. You have to put a price on water because ultimately utilities are in a trap. They are not recovering the cost. They have to maintain the, uh, the pool of human resources they have. They have to pay the salaries. They have to treat the water. They cannot just send it without supply it without treating. From where is the money coming? Nowhere. So, they are in a trap. Oh, I am sorry. Now, too much of challenges. Let us let's look into opportunities uh, and I hope that few of you would soon start working on these. Now, first is institutional reform and institutional reform is necessary. If, if you see the agriculture sector uh, uh, right now, what you would see is there is a lot of dependence of farmers and uh, people living in rural areas which consume the maximum water on centralized systems. If you go back historically, you can see that it was never a centralized system that worked. It was always decentralized system. The farmers, the villagers, they maintain their own ponds, their own tanks. Now, the whole dependence has shifted to government and I am telling you it is not working. To highlight one of the case studies, so Tamil Nadu uh, is a drought prone area and uh, what happened was, so in a place in Tamil Nadu where they experienced droughts, in 2012, they had a normal rainfall and in 2013 they had a drought. Now, in 2013 a NGO called Dhan Foundation, they started working with the farmers and you would be surprised to know even though it was a drought year, they were able to produce more than a normal year rainfall. So, it is not only about monsoonal fluctuation, it is also about how re you react to, how prepared you are to these variations. And that is why I am saying that institu institutional reform is necessary. I am just highlighting it one, with one of the examples because we were given a task of uh, reforming the minor water resources department in Bihar and we saw that few of the, few of the structures were not at all there. I am just highlighting you which were they. So, they did not have any human resources wing and when we were on field. I, I was interacting with one of the senior officials who was hired way 30 years back and after that no hiring took place. So, all the new employees were on contract basis and the contract was being renewed every year. So, there was always a dilemma whether I am going to be renewed next year or not. And what that does is it takes interest away from the and it is natural, it is with us as well. If you are hired on a contractual basis, you are always suspecting whether I would be made permanent or not. And what this does is, it actually weakens your overall institution. So, when I was while I was traveling in the fields and uh, uh, I had a very senior official who was about to retire in 2-3 years and a freshly joined uh, employee who was on a contractual basis. When we were traveling on fields and we were identifying the bore wells that minor water resource department has. And that new employee was like, is this our bore well? And uh, that senior official said, no, no, this is not our, that one is ours. And then I asked, what after you leave the organization? How would this guy identify what your assets are? Because there is no record as such. We, because traditionally, if you see, the bore wells were named of the villages. This village, we have one bore wells. Now, there are so many private bore wells, how will you identify which one is yours? So, there are many idle assets lying here and there. We suggested that strengthening of human resources is definitely very important, but along with that also de uh, develop a water data center, where you have at least inventory of all the assets you have, all the ahars, all the tanks, all the pines, whatever different structures you have. That water management training institute that you are seeing right now. It was made to train engineers for working on flood systems. Now, tell me what would minor water resources department do with floods? They are working on bore wells, 
on ponds. So, we suggested okay, let it be either develop a new training institute for these people which provide a specific trainings or develop a wing at least which provides a specific training to these officials. Otherwise, there is no it, it would not make any sense it is irrelevant to provide flood training to these people. And the last point uh, the participatory irrigation management committee you will hear uh, this term a lot irrigation management transfer water user associations whenever you touch agriculture you will hear this word again and again and again and again. But I must tell you on ground if you go only few places at few places you will see that this is working at most of the places it has failed most of the places and why because of the way it has been constructed. So, there was a project by NABARD where the obligation was it was it was made mandatory that with each bore well you construct you will have to hand it over to a water user association and they went on constructing bore wells across state. Now, they had thousand of bore wells, but no water user association. On a particular night that they decided that now we have to build water user associations. They the NABARD officials, the minor water resource department all of them sat and randomly on paper they built 1000 water user associations. There were many mem members I interacted who were not knowing that I am part of this water user association forget our functioning of the water user association. So, these are the on ground challenges that you will also see once you start working in this sector. Now, while we talk about urban water system I have deliberately kept accountability at, at the first place. Try and develop a system we are also working you will also have to work on this try and develop a system where you can assure accountability. System such as RTI where at least you can get the information once you file an application. Develop a similar system a better system all of us use technologies in day to day life. Uh, Again, I, I will tell you an example. So, there is a, a new a very small company I think of two or three people started in Bangalore. It is called next drop and the service it provides is it just tells you at what time water supply is going to come. And the irony is ideally it should be the role of the water supply board, but since water supply board is not able to do this a new organization has pop up and which is running successfully it just supplies the uh, information on message that today you will receive water at 4 am and it is doing a lot of good they have won prizes in different uh, conferences and workshops. So, that is the that is the most the primary challenge we will have to address the accountability water in water accountability is very very low whether it is CPCB whether it is water supply boards we will have to see how to develop it. Again I will not go through all of these you, you will have to think about mechanisms such as OBA. Now, OBA is output based aid it, it is a new kind of funding mechanism that has been adopted what it does. So, there are two kinds of funding mechanism one is it on the basis of the bid you have made and on the basis of the infrastructure laid down after a certain progress you have made in your project you are paid that percentage of the total project cost. What OBA does is it reserves the right to pay the cost to itself and it pays cost only based on output. So, if you are able to meet the output standards that are mentioned in the contract only then you will be paid and what it does is it it actually ensures equal services to all because what is happening right now is in posh areas you will find good roads good water supply everything but in lig low income group or ews you will find that these are not of good quality and the reason always have been the funding mechanism the interest of private partner who who is implementing it now oba negates these negative impacts because it pays only once you are able to achieve those standards 
irrespective of the pipelines, irrespective of your services. So, there, there could be many other innovative mechanisms that could be developed. Again, you will have to work on this. You will have to see what to do in this. And that is why I said these are all opportunities and one or more of you would be interested is in any one of these sectors. You might be interested in agriculture, in urban water, whatever, but you will have to do it. Uh, I will not go too much into delinking politics and water. You can read a lot of news article on this and uh, this has been a point of debate for long. So, there is no point of touching this. Now, better HIS, hydrological information system. Again, I am telling you this is a sector which can earn you a lot of money. This, this is a prospective sector where especially people who are interested to work in the technical side of water, who are interested in doing modelings, they should be interested in doing some these kind of things. If you can develop a cost effective HIS, I am telling you any government would be willing to buy it. You have the knowledge of hydrology, you can find friends who can develop apps. Develop a cost effective app, develop it on a pilot scale and say that this is the potential of this app. Now tell me if I do it in a more robust way, is there a willingness to buy? I am telling you there would be, there would be. So, especially the MTech people, I think uh, they are working a lot on the engineering side and modeling side. You should be thinking about working in these directions and it is very important. And last but not the least, we will have to look at integrated plans. We will have to develop integ integrated plans because wherever you see success has been achieved, most of these places had control over either one, two or all of these resources because they are in one way or the other linked to each other. If you read about Singapore, you will see this has happened. If you read about India, you will read about Jusco, that is Jamsetpur utility. It supplies water, energy, it provides wastewater services in Tata, in Jamshedpur uh, district in uh, Jharkhand. And you will see that it has received numerous awards because of its efficient working. And I am telling you, none other utility stands even in close to Jusco. But when Jusco tried doing the same thing in Mysore, it failed. And there are several reasons for that. And that is why it all depends on how the overall project has been planned. If, if it has been planned in an integrated way from beginning, the chances of it becoming a success is more. Now, uh, since we are doing a project on circular, circular economy, I will just, uh, this, this uh, process diagram actually uh, highlights the same thing that I showed by that pictorial representation of different sectors using water and disposing it without even thinking where it is going. Now, when you look at the circular economy concept, it talks about reducing water uses. So, that is demand side control, reusing it, increasing your supply and recycling it. You can use it for the same purpose you used. And finally, recover. So, in most of the countries where circular economy approach has been adopted for wastewater, you would see that they do not consider wastewater as waste. They have considered it as resources and why it is a resource. Because it, it has been shown in different studies that apart from recovering water, it can be used for several other pro purposes. We can use it for production of nitrogen fertilizer, phosphate fertilizer which are in short in uh, many of the areas. I, I think one of the PhD candidates from Terry was working on that. And they, but I must mind you there are associated risks. And before implementing any of these, we will have to see what are the associated risks. But that should not prevent us from using wastewater as a resource because from both pollution angle and from uh, resource availability angle, it is important to address wastewater. Now, this is a river, I know it does not look like a river, but it is a river uh, which was seasonal. It is called Kali river and it flows through Meerut. It's com it comes from Mujaffarnagar, flows through Meerut, meets Hindan. 
but due to the industrial discharge and municipal waste water coming from nearby areas it has now become perennial so now you can find water across the year the water quality was analyzed and it was found to be polluted with many 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 pollutants even heavy metals forget about bod do all now the the challenging part is i heard a minister saying that wherever there is water there would be agriculture and it's right because farmers need water water is the major input in agriculture this water if you see these pipelines the thick pipelines you will see numerous of these pipelines across the river and these are being used to irrigate fields mostly sugar cane fields and that sugar is coming to delhi and we are eating it gladly so again that that is a, that is a issue of food chain you will have to analyze and you will have to address system in a systematic way sometimes solving problem in one sector may lead to solution to the other sector as well so once you treat your waste water this would be clean your food would be not polluted and ultimately you would be healthy so these are all linked now when we we are talking about circular economy concept i said that we can learn a lot from other countries especially countries such as singapore which which is a water scarce country has used it in the most judicious way and the way they have branded the overall thing they call it new water new water they don't call it recycled water or treated waste water they call it new water australia if you look at australia their data management is exemplary you love to see the hydrological information system they have they didn't have anything in 1980s they have just come up with these thing due to several water issues and i must tell you i have interacted with several experts they all of them have said that what india is experiencing right now several other countries have already experienced so it's not like we are having a unique problem it's it's just the stage at which we are in the development process but that shouldn't prevent us from acting things will not happen on its own we'll have to act and that is why we have cases with us i have just in, interviewed dr kartik chandran who worked on uh, waste water treatment he works with the columbia university and uh, he won award this year uh, for efficiently treating waste water as well as deriving nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers from it in addition to also in some cases extracting energy from the sludge so these all venues are there to be worked on especially in indian context and i'm just telling you these things as an opportunity where you can focus your interest now when we were uh, i think i'm still in time yes so when we were analyzing the circular economy concept that sounds very interesting but it's important to analyze how that could be adopted we were looking at the drivers what could be the drivers for adopting circular economy pathway and most of them told that it is water scarcity so maybe we should wait for the time when the place is water scarce but at least we should act the at the places where there is already water scarcity and name me a metro city which doesn't have water scarcity problem everywhere we have so the first driver we have now as far as technical and financial challenges are concerned technical challenges most of them said no there is not so much of technical challenges it's more about willingness because there are many private sectors many experts providing technology at a cost efficient in a cost efficient manner but the point is there is not much willingness from the government or the utilities to buy it and that take us to the financial challenges because they don't have enough fund so ultimately the point will come to should we price or shouldn't we price water and the answer would always be yes now what is public perception when when we spoke to few people would you mind drinking treated waste water now there are several issues there are cultural issues there are several issues there are trust issues we don't trust whether it would be treated to a certain standard that it is of drinking quality so most of them said no we would not want to drink 
but yeah we can wash car we can wash utensils we can do some other things with scale a big problem a very very big problem a uh, few of the people think that if i break down the problem it would be easier to solve sometimes it is sometimes it's not to meet the economy of a scale sometime it is required to do it at a city level now today only i am traveling to bangalore to meet the chairperson of Car uh, karnataka urban water supply board he is facing the same problem he is saying we are treating water to a certain level but nobody is willing to buy it now we are going to have a discussion on how to make it the whole business more viable so just breaking the problem into smaller things may not solve the problem however at scale many of the on ground practitioners have said that they have got some success at community or rwa level where regulating the problems regulating the reuse of waste water is easier who should be the manager you will hear a lot about ppp once you start working in urban water sector whether it should happen or it shouldn't happen again it it, it has both pros and cons and we should not just negate it and quote and quote i am telling you don't use the word privatization ppp is not privatization it's not privatization Wo privatizing water is very difficult especially in india with a strong political framework we have nobody can privatize water easily except ground water which is already privatized whether you are using it or i am using it so ppp can be a way out but we'll have to see how to develop a framework so that ppp works efficiently it's not just about okay i am transferring my responsibility to a private sector and it can handle it it will not be able to handle it we will have to see how to design that ppp uh decentralized versus centralized again the problem of scale the problem of regulation who would be the manager and all and we have mixed responses because at a local level it would be easier to regulate but do you have the capacity we don't know now in terms of phases now this is a point where everyone agreed that when you are treating waste water target industry is first as the buyer because in few places like hyderabad they are paying as high as 50 to 70 rupees per kiloliter of water they would be easily buying water uh, treated waste water if you uh, assure that you are supplying water of a certain standard residents yes it is happening in some places but definitely for non potable uses and in some cases where there is no other option left especially in coastal areas where uh, these uh, very costly mechanism of treating saline water is happening and all at those places it might work but again it's it's the most difficult thing and we shouldn't target this thing right now now on regulations do we have the regulations yes we have uh, we shouldn't say that we do not have stringent regulations we have stringent regulations but how to make it usable how to enforce it again an example from field so while uh, uh, i was i was with rajendra singh uh, who is uh, also called water man of india and uh, we were disc discussing th this with the dm of meerut so the plan is to rejuvenate hindan under the broader um, umbrella of rejuvenating ganga when we were, uh, we were discussing uh, i was interacting with a guy who is from cpcb and he said that cbcb is now planning to install a meter which would be installed at the effluent point of every industry and it will automatically send data of water quality to a central unit now whether that instrument works or not nobody knows but just that information of putting a uh, instrument has made many of the industries to take more robust treatment of the water waste water that is coming out so sometimes there could be very minor correction in the overall regulations and you can see the effect ah this is uh, going to one of the fin uh, final slides we were doing a study on how to bring in collective action we 
talk a lot about collective action, participatory use. It is necessary for water sector and for that matter any sector which involves, which is a common pool resource, the support of all the stakeholders. We study these factors. These factor, factors came out as a result of literature review that we did, that these factors are essential for any collective action to happen in water. And out of these factors, I think we did three, four uh, outside uh, India case studies and six or seven case studies in India. And one thing we found in common was communication and coordination, monitoring and accountability and presence of threat or opportunity are the major drivers for collective action. And so, uh, being a researcher, I see this as an opportunity. See places where you have already threat. You have a threat of water security. You do not have enough water. Target those areas. Target monitoring systems and target communication systems. So, I am not asking you to change the entire institutions, but if at the beginning we can target these three, we will be a step ahead in achieving water secured areas. And therefore, we club these indicators as triggers, facilitators and sustainers. And you can clearly see that sustainers were the most important. They got the highest score and this score is based on the research as well as stakeholders views about the factors, what they found as the most important thing. I would advise all of you to read a case studies from Andhra Pradesh that is AP FAMS. That is a very, very good case study about participatory use of groundwater and very interesting. We talk a lot about caste issues, we talk a lot about socio-economic strata that our society has, especially in rural areas that is more prominent. You see how they have done it. It is not like Andhra Pradesh does not have these issues. And the sad part is, it has been talked a lot in several seminars, but I cannot see a replica of that model and that is a sad part. So, there are several best practices lying here and there and it is not always necessary to invent new things. Sometimes it is necessary to find out best practices, highlight them, document them. Now, is gov government supporting this? Yeah, you will, you will hear a lot about Swachh Bharat, you will hear a lot about National Mission for Clean Ganga, Smart Cities and all. We are trying to address almost all these issues in different projects we are doing. And I am telling you there is a dearth of capacity in all these projects. They have announced huge money, huge funding for these projects, but they are also not sure how this would be done. What do you mean by Smart Cities? You will not find a single definition of smart cities. Some who is an IT guy will tell everything, okay, it is about installing apps, new apps, new instruments, more data. Some will say, no, 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 no. We need a better transport system. Some would, would say we would need a better energy system. So, even different ministries in the government gives different definitions of smart cities. That is why. And that tells you that the clarity is missing. And, and right now you will see the different players are pouncing on these missions since it involves a lot of money. And that also opens venues for you to work. But what I would suggest is choose the area of interest, choose whether you want to work in a rural setup, in an urban setup, or whether you want to work on regulatory issues, on policy issues, on modeling, on developing apps dependent on your uh, interests and there are problems everywhere to solve. It is not like there is opportunity on, on only in one sector and that was the message I wanted to convey. Thanks a lot. <laughs>